Well, good morning, everyone. There's not many sitting in the seats right now, but uh, we're going to start this on time because it is going to be recorded. And I think many people get lazy these days when they know it's going to be recorded. They have to forget it. I'll just listen to it later at my convenience. But um, I wanted to make a few uh, announcements here. Um, my sister Betsy has the produce stand over to the right there uh, with uh, a number of different items, the food items, and then also uh, soaps and other types, eye serums and things like that. Um, we have, uh, Debbie's going to give a presentation up there on uh, preserving foods, and that will be uh, um on 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 a uh, loudspeaker so you can hear her say that uh gary and lynette up there on the table will be giving uh a native salads and dressings demonstration uh peter behind us there is preparing for a canning he's getting the things ready so can them for a canning demonstration and eat all over here has the herbal remedies and things and then uh Next to this this table right here, we have free books and literature for anyone that's interested. And uh, also with Eat All Over There, I have uh, my book, Agriculture God's Way and Clean Culture, uh, a book that was written oh, 150 years ago, uh, 150, 125 years ago on agriculture that we are beginning to shift back into after going the gone the bad way of the chemicals and manures and things like that hey tina and uh so uh now kathy uh wingu dr kathy is supposed to come she isn't here yet she but when she does come she's going to set up and she's an integrated uh integrative doctor with a holistic approach and she'll be doing free blood pressure checks and free lifestyle counsels so uh, i guess we'll begin now the uh the title of this talk since each uh of our announcements of these agricultural meetings is that healthy food makes healthy people. You got to have healthy food. You're not going to be healthy. So, but the, the title of this talk is food allergies, food sensitivities, foods that weaken rather than strengthen and lectins. All of those are the same thing with different names. The foods that are allergies, we're going to find out in this talk are proteins. The, those foods that we are sensitive to cause can cause emotional problems. We're going to conclude with some foods that do that. Uh, and then foods that weaken. That's something everyone can relate to, you know, where you start to get run down, you know, and uh, um, you don't feel so good. You need a cup of coffee or, or a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi to pep you up after you have a meal. That's uh, foods that weaken. And then lectins, that's the evolutionary approach now as to what these foods are. They have something wrong with them. Now, we're going to be looking at it from a biblical perspective because God made the creation and he knew what we'd do wrong with it. And so he has the corrections for us. So we're going to take a look at that first, though. Uh, I'm going to go over my history of allergies because it's a uh, quite eye-opening. Now, when I was a child, um, I remember about three years old and come and wake my mother up at night. I couldn't breathe. I had asthma. And uh, so I was told I had allergies and they gave me skin pricks, a bunch of them, and then a shot every week for a few years. Boy, did I hate that. Didn't do a thing for me because I had these, I had these allergies, allergies to food, allergies to, to pet dander and grass when it was mowed and all that kind of stuff. So, and then I outgrew it when I was 13 or 14 years old, common with uh, asthma. You outgrow it at 13 or 14. You change your diet at that time. You don't eat what your mom presents. You start eating other things. And I had started working in an orchard. So I was eating peaches and apples and pears all I could have, all I wanted. So that was a, quite a change in my diet. So then, then uh, when I was in my early 20s, I started building this stone house, this three-sided stone, and uh, hurt my back. So I was sent to a, a, told of a chiropractor, and the family that told me of the chiropractor, they had a lot of allergies, but 
they had an orchard and they were spraying poisons and they lived in the middle of the orchard. So they had gone and had extensive allergy testing in California for a month. And so they led me to a chiropractor who would work on my back, but he was a kinesiologist chiropractor and he studied, he studied the energy that was needed to keep the muscles strong so their people's back wouldn't go out. And so they were weakening, they had weakened muscles because of allergies to things. And so he was trying to figure this out. So he knew that I was an organic gardener at that time. I was in my early 20s. And uh, so he said, bring in some organic foods and some non-organic. Because I worked in the sprayed peach orchard and all the other sprayed stuff. So I would bring it in and I found out I was allergic to the stuff that was sprayed and I wasn't allergic to the stuff that was grown organically. So that sort of pinpointed an allergen is uh, can just be poisoning. You're responding to the poison that's put on your food. So, uh, but I also noticed another thing. Some of the foods that I grew in this bulldozed land here, um, I had allergies to. And I thought, no, that's interesting. I'm growing them organically. They don't have poison on them, but they weaken me. Because remember, he's a kinesiologist, chiropractor, and they study energy. And he had a muscle testing uh, where he could see what foods weakened me. And of course, the sprayed ones did, but some, some of the, uh, and also there was one apple of all the varieties of apples we tested that even though it was sprayed, it didn't weaken me. And it didn't weaken other people too. But that apple was a Cortland, and Cortland apple is the one apple, uh, I think they have others now, but it was the one apple at that time that could be used in salads because it wouldn't brown. In other words, there was something in it that would prevent oxidation, and uh, that was that's whatever that was, could, could even withstand the poisons that were being sprayed on it. So, okay, so I, I moved to Utah. Now, Utah is a desert state. The soils are very, very rich, very rich. Um, and I was there for a while and all my allergies went away. Now, I'm growing my own food. So I'm eating my own food and testing. All my allergies went away. Then I moved back to Connecticut. My allergies all came back again. Then I moved to California, another land flowing with milk and honey, very rich soil no allergies. So I stayed there longer. And I thought, well, I don't have allergies anymore. Not only that was I growing my own food, but I also was saving my own seed. So then I moved to Arkansas. Now, Arkansas is the South where they grew cotton, cotton, and cotton until they wore out the land. And the place where I was uh, at the academy was a worn out soil very worn out soil. Uh, they tried to prevent the erosion uh, with putting contour berms in, but they had to abandon the place and let it go to forest. But the erosion holes were so deep that you could lose a tractor in it. That's how much they wore out the soil. So I had, but I had my own seed and I knew this seed was good and I would not have any allergy. I planted all that seed. 13 of my foods that I grew, I was allergic to. It had nothing to do with the plant itself. You're not allergic to tomatoes. You're not allergic to potatoes. You're not allergic to this, that, or the other. You're allergic to the condition of the soil. And when the soil is poor. So 13 I'm, I'm allergic to. The second year, because my job there as farm manager was to rebuild the soil. The second year, I was allergic to six of those. The third year, I was allergic to three. So as I improved the soil, the allergic response went away. So that's that's the foundation I want to start with here uh, is so that we understand where um, what allergies really are. They're not the food. Um, I found it interesting also uh, when I would uh, buy. I bought popcorn in a 50 pound bag because I was eating popcorn. Well, it takes six months or a year to eat it. Uh, and then I buy another bag, no problem, six months to a year. Then I bought a third bag, same same co-op. And the third bag weakened me. I didn't even know it. I was almost on crutches um, because I had the Lyme disease and that really aggravates allergies. Allergies really respond strongly. So uh, 
it was just they bought it from a different farm. All organic, all three, but from a different farm. So it's the soil that what determines the agriculture. Now, there, that, that determines what the allergies are. Now, there are two stories abound about our food supply. The evolution story that we ran around like monkeys and baboons searching for food. Uh, and then we have God's story where God gave us plants to eat and that they were very good for us. You can read that in Genesis 1, 29, 30, and 31. And that we were to till the ground and to serve the ground. That's in Genesis 2, 5. And then uh, he gave us a homestead in Genesis 2, uh, Genesis 2, uh, 7, 8, and 9. And uh, so now we have these two stories. The evolution story uh, doesn't carry with it any responsibility or obligation to care for our ground or care for the environment. But the, the, uh, it just says the word to struggle and fight for what's there and the strongest is going to survive. That's the evolution story. Now, the creation story tells us that we're given by the creator a work of service to the ground and the garden homestead we're given that would maintain an environment that was pl delightfully pleasant, but delicately designed. This is a creation story. The word Eden in Hebrew, because uh, remember that he was, God made a garden for them in Eden. Uh, the word Eden in Hebrew means um, pleasure, delicate and delight. So in Genesis 2, 8 and 9, it says, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now that's those two verses. Now every tree in this garden home said was either or both designed for beauty and food. This environment was designed to promote a pleasant and delightful environment, but it was delicately designed. It needed our careful service to the ground. In Genesis 2, 5, it says so. As we planted the design garden, in Genesis 2, 7 and 8, God gave us a garden and it designed it for us, and that we were to keep up that garden, as it says in Genesis 2, 15. Now, the creation story fits hand in glove with our planet's home need of upkeep to be a healthy, happy people. God designed healthy food in abundance. Now, the evolution story says we just need to fight harder to kill off everything that's trying to eat our food. Today, we use poisons on our food, insecticides, fungicides, bactericides, viricides, herbicides, rodenticides, bird deterrent chemicals on our berries to win the war against nature. Uh, do you think that maybe some of these poisons that we need in the when we're thinking the evolution story is part of the allergens that we have here? Now, our war against nature stems from the evolution story instead of the creation story where a creator gave us a paradise that we were responsible to keep up. Evolution's foundation that competition, fighting and killing will give us a paradise in the end. It's not working out for our good. Now, the creation story also says in Genesis 2, 9, that we were given a tree of life, not a tree of death, fight and struggle and kill, a tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, good and evil in Hebrew, tav and ra, are two words that imply functional and dysfunctional. We were given the opportunity opportunity to know only how our paradise home would function as a paradise, but we were given the freedom to learn how it would malfunction if we manage our environment any other way than God's way. So which story seems reasonable in the light of our planet's home's need today? But the Bible doesn't leave us without directions on where we got off the track and where we can get back on track again if we can humble ourselves and show respect for the Creator's design by caring for the environment the way His way. And that's how repair begins. And so we're going to be looking at this repair design here. Now, Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes 10, 17. He was supposed to be one of the wisest men that ever lived on earth. Uh, he tells us that our, that, um, he says, my princes eat for strength. 
So food should be strengthening rather than weakening. So there's a way, obviously, the way God designed it initially for food to be strong. So um, our, also our creator warned the first recorded killer, Cain, he said, Cain, when you till the ground, it's not going to yield to you her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. Now, the reason why Cain, Cain was disobedient, obviously, you know, you don't go around killing, it, killing anybody. So unless you're not doing what God says. So um, the reason he was a fugitive is he would not take care of the land the way he's supposed to. And so he'd trash it, you know, like the farms and uh, I've seen a number of farms uh, that have been worn right out. And uh, um, he would have to go to another piece of land, but he was also a vagabond. In other words, move to a new piece of land, trash it, and uh, move to another piece of land, trash it because he wasn't taking care of it. He didn't have environmental responsibility that God gave and appointed mankind. Instead, he was just doing his own thing. And he was learning about malfunction, you know, Tav and Ra, good and evil, you know, uh, how to ruin things. So uh, he didn't keep up the ground the way he should be. And so he had to move on. Now, uh, in Wisconsin, uh, the Academy... I, I worked at there, they were given a farm. And the reason they were given the farm is because it wouldn't grow anything anymore. <laughs> the forest on the border of the property had oak trees in it. It was a nice oak forest. So the squirrel would take the acorns and they run over on the other farm side and plant them in the ground. The trees would grow six feet, 12 feet, and then die. They couldn't even establish themselves in that ground. Um, down in Arkansas, I told you about the ground there. It was just so worn out. Cotton, cotton after cotton. Dr. Reem sells about one farmer putting his fingers in his suspenders and saying, I've worn out three farms. And Dr. Reem's response is, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And uh, do you know that there is a desert in the state of Maine? Look how wet it is around here. Maine is just the same kind of environment. There's a desert there. You know why? That farmer kept doing what he was doing on that piece of land until he ruined it so bad plants would not even grow on it. And to this day, because it's 300 acres and it's windy, blowing sand, he, it's still a desert. He can't establish it back again because the, the shifting sand would cover the young trees that tried to grow on it. So we have a responsibility to the environment. And God gave us that responsibility, but in evolution, you don't have that responsibility. You just struggle and fight and get what you can, you know? Uh, so we're going to look a bit at allergens, okay? Now, the dictionary definition for allergy is a condition of unusual sensitivity to a substance or substances which in like amount don't affect others. And then it goes on to say, and it gives the descriptions of some of these, then it goes on to say allergens are usually protein substances. So we're going to look into proteins. And where did the first bad proteins come from to give weakening effects and other effects to us? Well, we'll go back to Cain. Um, well, but we got to start with what is a protein. A protein, God designed, in his design, he designed everything green. You notice everything's green? Okay, those are the chloroplasts in the leaf. And those leaf solar panels gather sunlight and they put CO2 and water together and now you got sugar. That feeds everything on planet Earth. Everything on planet Earth. But the air is 78% nitrogen. You take that nitrogen out of the air and you add it to the sugar and what do you have? It's called protein. So that's God's design. The sugar that's made is added with some nitrogen, and there you have the protein. So the nitrogen comes out of the air. Now, when Cain, he was also the first one to start cities. You read the Bible, that's the first cities that were started there. Now, in a city, you don't have, uh, you don't have the land to grow things naturally. So what they did in many cities, and you can read about this in Europe, um, 
in, in old time Europe is that they used the manure from the animals and they grew market gardens. So you could blow up your food with the manure, the nitrogen in the manure. Now, God designed you got to have some nitrogen, right? But you're supposed to get it out of the air and the plants do if you grow it that way. But you can use manure. And if you're in a city, somebody's growing it because you don't want to grow your food. And so they're going to blow it up with nitrogen. So they get more volume so they can get more money. Um, and so when you eat this kind of food that was grown with manures, it weakens people. Now, uh, these market gardens also had a side effect to that weakening. Um, Samson Morgan in the book Clean Culture uh, that I have over there, um, he talks about the Crimean War. Now, the Crimean War was before antibiotics. It was about 1900 or something like that. And the guys that would get wounded, these serious wounds that were from the cities tended to die from infection. But the, the boys from the countryside, they tended to heal, even though they got these bad wounds. Instead of getting the infection, the difference was the foods that the city boys were eating were grown on manure, a lot of manure, all the horses, you know, it was back during the day when uh, you had all these animals that were pulling this and that. And a matter of fact, I was ta talking to an old fellow when I was a kid uh, and he, he worked for the orchard over there. He was in his seventies and I was in my teens. And he remembers the, the uh, railroad cars, loads of manure coming up from New York City because it was all horses, you know, and then it spread out on the orchard. So close to the cities, all the foods were grown with manure. And this is a, a false kind of nitrogen to use. It's not what God designed. And so easily infected. People were easily infected. So Samson Morgan warns about that in his book there. Then, then we graduated away from manures into nitrogen fertilizer. And that came with World War I. And uh, now, we're, now we're making some real good explosives, you know. And these explosives are made out of nitrogen. Just think Oklahoma bombing. They put a, a van in front of the building full of fertilizer and detonated it. Um, they, they even take a 80 pound bag of ammonium nitrate fertilizer, soak it with gasoline, put a detonator in it, put it in a swampy area, like, like that, that, all those cattails out there, boom, instant one acre pond, <laughs> you know, from the explosion, it's very explosive stuff. They store it way at the end of the, away from the factory at the end of a rail line because it can detonate. Not only that, in California, they have what they call mysterious uh, haystack hay fires. That's because they use a lot of ammonium nitrate to force grow the hay. And that ammonium nitrate in there is volatile. And sometimes, well, there was like 150 some odd in the newspaper, mysterious haystack fires. They are all a result of this excessive nitrogen. So uh, we have... Um, the use of this excessive nitrogen here, and uh, it creates what the, what the dairy farmers call funny protein. Now, we have two major problems in agriculture today. The, the need to regenerate healthy soil and a major reason for the loss of the organic matter, carbon. Organic chemistry is carbon chemistry. The loss of the organic matter is the excessive use of the nitrogen. It burns the carbon right out of the ground. And then we also have a need to uh, regenerate healthy genetics in our food crops. Uh, using fertilizer, we have turned off the genes of our food because there are genes in our food that feed microbes that take the nitrogen out of the air and make the proteins. This is God's design. Genes in the plant, every one of these plants here is feeding from 50 to 100,000 different species of microbes. And many of them are taking nitrogen out of the air, giving it to the plant to make the protein that makes the structure of all the greenery out here and makes our body structure out of proteins from eating this greenery out here and the fruits from it and things like that and roots from it. Now, in Conventional agriculture, they use chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides. Uh, in organic agriculture, they use natural fertilizers and natural pesticides. For fertilizers, think manure and things like that. In God's agriculture, the soil is regenerated 
and this imparts disease and pest resistance to the crop. It's regenerated because not only do these plants feed the microbes that feed them, they feed the microbes that rebuild the soil and build the soil structure up more and more, put the carbon back in, take it out of the air, put it in the soil, then make homes for the night for the uh, microbes in the soil. So in God's design, fertilization is the duty of microbes that are supported by companion plants in a garden design. Disease resistance in God's design is imparted by the microbiome on the plant and in the plant, on the seed and in the seed. Now, God's way to grow our crops is microbial. Anything we do that kills back the microbes in the soil decreases the health and the strength that they are to impart to us. So how does God's way work? Now, plants were designed by God to be fertilized by microbes. Plants exude into the soil and upon their leaves, because there's microbes on the leaves, there's the rhizosphere, all the microbes around, around the edges of the roots of the plant, and the phylosphere, all the microbes that cover the surface of the, uh, of the leaf and the fruit. Just think of an apple. Have you ever picked an apple and shined it? You're wiping off the phylosphere of the apple. Okay, those are all microbes, millions and millions of them. That's what you're wiping off and the yeast and all kinds of things. So these plants exude into the soil and upon their leaves, microbe diets. Plants can make thousands of different diets. Every diet attracts a specific microbe. And each specific microbe makes specific nutrients for that plant. There are from 50 to 100,000 different microbe diets that each plant variety can make. There's this one company, I just read about it recently. They have recorded, it's an international company, they have recorded over 17 million different species of microbes that work with plants. That's a lot going on out there. Now, plants are designed with all the diets that they need to feed the microbes that make whatever nutrient fertilizers they need. And this is God's design for growing health, imparting food. So what went wrong with this system? Families stopped growing their own food. Food became a commercial commodity. It was sold by volume. The bigger, the better. So families grew food for taste and nourishment. Commercial growers grow food to make money. It was observed that manure increased volume, which meant more money, even though it reduced taste and nourishment. Now, it was learned that nitrogen in the manure could blow food up and make it bigger. And then, of course, the byproduct of war was nitrogen. So they learned to use the nitrogen from the nitrogen producing factories that were producing explosives. They just turned that nitrogen around and started putting it on the land. Now, um, plants forced to grow bigger with nitrogen get obese and are malnourished like obese Americans are at higher risk for disease. You've all heard that report. Obesity, they're at higher risk to disease. Plants forced to grow obese have more sickness and disease and insect attack. You know, it's just common sense. Malnourished plants signal God's garbage disposal crews, just like the plants are signaling the microbes in the soil. I'm feeding you this diet, come on over. And so you can make these fertilizers for me. Malnourished plants signal God's garbage disposal crews to come and eat them. Insect have antenna for this purpose as the infrared bounces off of any of these, this greenery around here. Remember, plants have not to grow in the sunlight. As it bounces off the greenery, they take a readout. The insects take a readout. The infrared bounces off and they have antenna. You know, all these insects have antenna. And it's for picking up this readout and it will give them a readout of the health condition of the plant. And the insects will only eat plants 
that will weaken you, that have low nutrient levels. Okay? And so fungus, when the spore blows around and settles on something, it takes a readout, just like a spacecraft landing on land somewhere. It takes a readout and it can tell whether this thing is unhealthy for humans and animals to eat. And if it is, it germinates and grows. And we call many of these things fungal diseases. Virus, bacteria, enter a wound, you know, hey, you get hail, anything, you know, um, and they begin to grow in that wound if the, if the mineral content is too low, if the plant is malnourished, if it's just one of these, it could be forced with nitrogen or it just could be, could be a pretty poor ground, like a worn out soil where if the acorns are planted by the squirrel and they come up and then a plant dies after a while. You know, or uh, so um, bacteria and virus, they respond by not growing on healthy plants. Now, we spray malnourished plants with products that will kill God's garbage disposal crews, poisonous chemicals or natural poisons can be used. And then we eat the sprayed and the malnourished plants. So if we want to not have allergies or sensitivities, we've got to grow foods that are strong enough to resist pest attack. And then, of course, we'll be strong enough to resist sickness and disease. Because we just, that's just a name for pest attack. Now, there's another problem. When we save seed to grow our food plants, we select what seed we want. Com commercial growers select seed this way. They want the plant obese to have more volume because more volume equals more money. They want them to have cosmetic appeal. They want them to look like they're healthy. Uh, they want uniformity in size for packaging. They want uniformity in looks and shape. Um, and they also want um, thin, thick skins for taste, I mean, for, for shipability. And uh, at first, when they sh started growing this type of food, taste didn't really matter to people. They would just add more sugar or salt or butter or oil when they served the food. But when taste began to matter, you would think they would grow healthier food. That wasn't the case. They began to grow excitotoxins in the food. I. Uh, saw some really nice yellow pineapple um, that was sweet. And I thought, oh boy, there's somebody's growing some good pineapple. So I got out my refractometer to take a measurement, uh, a mineral content measurement, and this was in the poor range. I find out later that they had bred into it the ability to make um, mannitols. You know, sorbitols, you ever hear of sorbies, candy, or mannitols? They, 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 these, they gave you a sugar taste in your mouth. You know, like stevia gives you that sugar taste in your mouth, but no nutrition either. So, um, so that's how they solved that problem. And then, uh, and then we have wheat. Wheat, um, wheat's the most, uh, they would, I would say, the most important food on earth. Matter of fact, you've got oil, gold, and wheat as standards for money. Okay, that's, that's how high a category wheat is. And um, the wheat, they were losing a lot of wheat because, and losing more because it's a four or five foot tall plant. And that takes a lot of potassium to build that stem so it will stand up. And if it falls over, it doesn't get harvested, so you lose it. Well, someone mutated some wheat put it in front of an extremely toxic chemical when they were sprouting. And uh, the guy ends up uh, breeding this and he gets a one and a half, 18 inch foot tall wheat plant. So now they're standing up and they say, hey, this is great. So they give him a Nobel Peace Prize for this short stem wheat. But not only did he dwarf the stem of the wheat, but he changed enormous numbers with that mutation of proteins. And what is, the, what is the definition for allergens? Proteins, okay? So now he's made all these proteins that we're not supposed to digest, can't digest. Think of it this way, rattlesnake poison is a protein.
you know. And and so we have all these things that we're allergic to. So wheat became it just went skyrocketing. All the people allergic to wheat just shot through the ceiling. And so we have gluten intolerance everywhere because we got these proteins. Gluten is the proteinaceous part of the wheat. We've got these proteins in it that are making everybody sick. So, uh, and then, then we advanced a little farther and we went into genetic modification. You know, we've got sickness and disease, so we better genetically modify the plants so they don't get the sickness and disease. The problem with that is you not only get the changes you want, but you get up to 10,000 other changes, and many of them are proteins that you can't digest. We were never meant to digest. So now we have even more allergens, more sensitivity, as well as weakening from our plants. Now, proteins were never designed for us. To, the, these these uh, foreign proteins were never designed for us to eat. And our response is that they're poisonous and they weaken of us. Now, what about growing produce God's way? Now, the produce is smaller when you grow it God's way. They're not blowing it up. It doesn't have to be obese because, you know, if you're growing it for yourself and you're growing it God's way, it's just going to be nutritious. That's it. You know, and, and it does not ripen at the same time for mechanical harvest, but it is better for home harvest to have it spread out. And uh, and it's not tough skinned enough for commercial handling, but it's much more tender and nicer to eat. Uh, it requires organic matter to be, re be replenished in the soil for the microbe habitat so the microbes can feed the plant. So you have to do more work to rebuild the soil. You've got to regenerate it. And the herbicides must be stopped because um, the most used herbicide on earth is uh, Roundup, you know, glyphosate. And glyphosate is uh, the most used antibiotic on earth. It was designed and developed for an antibiotic, but it worked real good because not only did it kill the microbe, uh, but it also uh, killed the plant because the mechanism to kill the microbe was to tie up a particular enzyme necessary for the microbe to live in order to, you know, to, to keep living. You got to have these different enzymes for the reproduction process. But it also kills the enzymes of many of the weed plants. And if you ever see a crop sprayed with Roundup, uh, we have some right down the road there. Um, for two weeks, that corn looks sick. And it is sick, but it's strong enough to make it. And then the weeds die. Okay? And uh, that's often the way it is with many of the drugs the doctors give us. We're big enough to make it, uh, even though it sickens us. You know how lousy you feel when you take the doctor's medicines? Uh, but it kills the microbe inside you, okay? So it's a, it's a we call it a trade-off, okay? So, um, so now you have to replace the organic matter in the soil because um, you've been damaging it and killing off the microbes and you have to rebuild the organic matter and, and, and things like that in the soil. So um, how much, what time is it now? I want to... 11.39. Okay. Well, um, I didn't want to go too long, but um, this is what I wanted to conclude with. Some of you out there may be sitting and saying, I don't have allergies. Foods that I eat don't weaken me. Okay. Um, you know, I don't have any sensitivities to them. Um, I ate some corn that had mycotoxins in it. My corn that I grew only because I didn't harvest it at the right time. And uh, mycotoxins, it, myco, mycology, the study of fungus, mycotoxins means fungal toxins. The mental hospitals in the United States, when they used to have them, now they put them in homes and residential areas, um, could have been cleaned out practically if these people were taken off of corn products. You know how corn 
permeates everything. You've got cornstarch and everything. You've got uh, high glucose corn syrup um, in, in all the foods. This is what processed foods have in them. And these mycotoxins on the corn are very poisonous. And uh, we get it in our foods. I've got a friend that um, uh, has a small farm, small farm. 1,400 acres. But he talks about some of the other corn growers. He grows corn and soybean and a few other things. And he talks about some of the corn growers near him. And they have bins that they put the corn in. And these bins are the side of my yard. You know, just... And, and they have like th three, four, five, six, seven of these bins full of corn. And this guy, neighbor there, he said he wasn't getting good corn prices. So he just kept the bin, hold, held on to it. The corn prices went up and then he sold the bins and they were loaded with mycotoxin, loaded. So you can imagine that much corn going into the food supply and how many other guys are doing that too because it wasn't good prices. And uh, to give you an example of um, what these mycotoxins do, there's a famous one, and probably everyone's heard of it. And this is the mycotoxin that grows on rye. Uh, and, in, in, and in a couple centuries back in Europe, they used to call when villages um, all went mad. And it would happen in the spring, later in the spring before crops came in, new food came in, and they're eating their old rye. This rye had a fungus on it. It's called ergot. And that fungus, ergot, was made famous by Timothy Leary. And the what it produced was LSD, if you're familiar with that, LSD. I, and that's a fungal toxin. And it makes people go out of their mind for about eight hours. And, uh, you know, some people were doing it for fun. But uh, it's not fun. I think of Art Linkletter. He was a famous TV person there. And uh, his daughter was doing it, and she thought she could fly out of an eight-story building. Obviously, she got killed. And uh, th these are some of the things it does. But this Michael Coxon here in the corn, and I've t eaten it, and I've gone out of my mind. It makes you manic depressive. I've walked up on the mountain thinking about how many people have died on that cliff over there and, and one and I, but I'm knowing in the back of my mind, no, you know, you can't think that way. And previously I'd come down and was manic out of my mind. So she said, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to go talk, <laughs> go down to your mom's. And uh, so, or first she went and locked the, do the door of the bedroom. I thought nothing of putting my foot up, kick the door off and walk in again. I was manic out of my mind. And uh, it was because I was eating the corn. I had been away and uh, I didn't get to harvest it. And on the bottom of the corn, you could see where it gets moldy. I'm careful now when I harvest my corn. I've got to harvest the uh, well, I harvest some of the blue corn you can see hanging in the window there. Uh, the animals didn't leave me much, but I got a lot of popcorn I got to harvest. And I had harvested the sweet corn and it was eating. I ate it for lunch when I came. I mean, for supper when I got there, breakfast, lunch, and supper. Because I figured I don't want to miss my good sweet corn. You only get it once a year. I was out of my mind with this stuff. And this stuff was wor worse than the LSD because that lasts eight hours. This lasts two days two days and you doesn't finally wear off but four days so you got to concentrate on yourself you know just no nope, don't believe anything just sit still do nothing that's what i ended up doing and that has happened to me over a about a 30 35 year period four different times one time in california uh, i don't have a liver obviously that removes that toxin uh, too easily. So when we talk about food sensitivities, you may not think you have these things, but if you tangle with a lot of this and it's cut, it's cut down, you know, all our poor quality crops, when you get poor quality wheat, they just take, you know, <laughs> they calculate this many railroad car loads for this one railroad car load of poor quality wheat. And they mix it. They mix everything like that. That's a lot of money. People can't afford to lose that money because remember, it's all commercial agriculture. We're not growing our own food anymore. So this is what we have to uh, consider here is that we have to grow things our way and we have to learn to grow them God's way.
Okay, and, and that requires regenerating the soil. Now, my soil here, you would say, well, you're growing organically. How come your corn did that? And the reason that it did is this all this land here has been bulldozed. No topsoil whatsoever. And so we've been building for years and years and years this topsoil. And it doesn't build up overnight. It doesn't build overnight. But there is a faster way than um, just trying to haul in organic matter. If you grow in a garden, hauling in organic matter will work good because you don't have much land to deal with. But when you're talking agricultural land and, uh, you know, most of these farmers now are always, you know, at least a thousand acres or so, uh, you can't haul in enough organic matter. So you have to learn to grow it. And so this is why when we go on a tour, we'll see some of the things that you can grow to build the soil up because the plants will grow the soil and build it up faster than, uh, than uh, any other way. And, uh, and they will supply us the housing for the microbes, the free living ones, that will just take the nitrogen out of the air so that we'll have good, healthy crops. Okay, thank you. Now, um, I want to make uh, the announcements again because we have uh, more, more people here. Um, next to me here, we have a table and these are books that you can uh, look at. I mean, you could have, these are all free. See, see what uh, you think you'd like to learn. And then we have Eat All. She has many herbal remedies and other things at her table next there. And I have my two books, uh, one, one book for sale uh, that I wrote on growing agriculture God's way. And the other one there that uh, Samson Morgan wrote about 150, 125 years ago on, on trying to get us to not use manure in his day and don't, try that newfangled stuff called chemical fertilizers. And, uh, and then uh, at one o'clock, Susie will be presenting, uh, she'll be vending the food there. Uh, Debbie up there is where we're going next, okay? She's gonna be teaching us how to preserve, so all different ways to preserve things. And then um, Gary and Lynette on, up there on the deck there, they will be showing uh, native uh, salads and dressings, how you can use all kinds of native weeds around here, which have much more nutrition in them than our stuff in the store, okay? And, uh, and then uh, Peter will be showing us behind you there, he'll be showing us how to can. Uh, he's preparing things now for the canning operation. Okay, I think that covers it. And uh, we will go to the next station up there and see what Debbie has to present for us on preserving foods.